Um, uh, it's going to be a really fun meeting, I think, and a very educational meeting. Uh, I'll try not to talk for a whole hour. Uh, so we'll leave some time for some questions and perhaps even some answers. So uh, I'm very fortunate to work with a, uh, a group of uh, physicians at Cedars, uh, some of whom you've met, and particularly Dr. Mai and Dr. Moser, who do uh, all the diagnostic imaging and percutaneous procedures, and Dr. Louis, uh, who does uh, the epidural blood patches. Um, what we're going to talk about mainly this morning, but not exclusively, uh, are people who have a spontaneous leak in their spine. So uh, the first, let's say, 80% of what I'll be talking about is going to be about what we nowadays call spontaneous intracranial hypotension. And uh, we usually say that it was first described by a, uh, a German neurologist. His name was Georg Schaltenbrand, and he described some uh, patients, they were all women, uh, who when they would get up, they'd have this horrendous headache, and when they would lie down, they felt great. Now, of course, back in the 1930s, there was uh, no CT, there was no MRI scan. Uh, there was uh, something that was called pneumoencephalography, wasn't really used, and geography wasn't really used. Really, the only tests that they had uh, were lumbar punctures. So he did a lumbar puncture, and he found that in this particular group of women, he could not get any spinal fluid. And the Latin word for spinal fluid is, is liquor, so he called it a liquoria, which means complete absence of spinal fluid. And for a while, this was called Schaltenbrand syndrome, uh, but it turned out that he was a, a Nazi collaborator. So since the 1950s, people stopped using that term. Now, now actually, it was really first described by a group of uh, French neurologists and neurosurgeons in the 1920s uh, and late 19-teens because they had patients with subdural hematomas. They would remove the blood clot from the brain and they found that you know, the brain was really sagging and it would not return to its normal position. Um, so after Schaltenbrand, there were some Swedish neurologists who said, well, some of these patients actually have a little bit of spinal fluid. So they called it hypolycoria. Then it became known as intracranial hypotension when people really started measuring, doing, uh, putting catheters in patient's brain and measuring the pressure. So since the 70s, it's really been called intracranial hypotension. Uh, then Dr. Mokri in the 1990s, uh, he found that uh, quite a few patients who obviously have this actually have normal pressure. So intracranial hypotension is really not the best term, uh, but I think it's the most useful term because most people and physicians, you know, we sort of know what that means. Uh, some people have called it uh, cerebral spinal fluid hypovolemia. Uh, that's, a, that's a misnomer, of course, because hypovolemia means low blood or low plasma volume. And the blood volume is normal, right, when you have a spinal fluid leak. This term, spontaneous spinal CSF leak, I don't know if that's really a good term either, because probably not everybody who has spontaneous intracranial hypotension uh, also uh, has a leak. Um, I saw my first patient back in uh, November of 1991. That gentleman on the right is Pete Wilson, who was uh, the governor here. Um, at that time, I was not here in California. I was a resident at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. And uh, we were presented a, a patient by a neurologist, Neith Folger. Neith Folger was the chairman of neurology there. And he saw uh, a young woman, 22, uh, who was an exotic dancer. And at her uh, place of, uh, of employment, there was a little bit of a brawl, and she like fell against, I don't know, a bar or something like that. And ever since that time, she had these terrible positional headaches. And she saw numerous neurologists there uh, in Florida, and nobody could figure it out. She'd had a brain CT that was normal. Uh, she never had a brain MRI. She saw Dr. Folger, and he said, well, you must have a spinal fluid leak. Uh, back then, that was considered to be like, really, really rare, right? Like almost every single patient would be written up in the literature. Um, that morning that he saw him, uh, and that's how good the Mayo Clinic works, so he saw me at the morning, and later in the morning, she had a myelogram. Uh, the myelogram was done. The myelogram showed this, uh, this cyst. That's where that little arrow is. Uh, that afternoon, we didn't do a blood patch, took her immediately to the operating room.
And uh, we saw this cyst. We didn't really know what to do with it. But that morning, we had operated on a brain aneurysm. So we thought, well, let's use the little clips that we use for brain aneurysm surgery. And uh, she had that cyst clipped. Um, and she did really well. And as far as I know, still doing uh, well without any recurrence. Um, I had an interest somewhat in connective tissue disorders uh, that I got through when I was in medical school. And, and we noticed that this patient was really double jointed. Uh, she also was very tall and lanky. Uh, and this, uh, this picture that you see of her, of her joint hypermobility when we wrote up this uh, case for the Journal of Neurosurgery, which is one of the neurosurgery journals, the, the editor said, yeah, you cannot put that picture in there because why would that be related? You, you know, so they threw that picture out. Uh, so that was back then. And then I came back to uh, uh, Rochester, Minnesota, and I you know, developed my interest in spinal fluid leaks. Um, Rochester, Minnesota is in Olmsted County. Olmsted County is the only county in Minnesota that does not have a natural lake. Uh, it, uh, it only really employs two kind of people. They either work for the Mayo Clinic or for IBM. And because of the Mayo Clinic, very, very few patients leave Olmsted County for their medical care. So they have really good uh, epidemiology. And we looked at uh, everybody in Olmsted County. And we found two patients with uh, a CSF leak, a spontaneous CSF leak. So we wrote that the prevalence must be 1 in 50,000. And uh, that's just based on two patients. And that's really the only time that's ever been studied in a you know, more or less uh, scientific fashion. So then when I uh, came to Los Angeles, the first few years, I didn't really see too many people with this. It was once in a while. Uh, but then after, you know, giving some talks to the ER physicians, they started recognizing this more. And uh, we started uh, tabulating um, the number of patients who come in through our ER uh, compared to some other diseases that we know pretty well how common it is. And what's interesting about the ER at Cedars is that it's not close to any major highway. Uh, it's really uh, very focused on sort of non-traumatic type of, uh, of pathology. Anyway, we found that for, any, for every two patients with a ruptured aneurysm, we found one patient with spontaneous intracranial hypotension. And the incidence of a ruptured aneurysm is about 10 per 100,000 uh, per year. So that's uh, 1,000 per 10 million. Uh, that's the population of LA County. So that would be about 500 people in LA County who get a spinal fluid leak diagnosed spontaneous onset each year. So, you know, probably it's, uh, the prevalence also is going to be a lot, lot higher. And these, you know, I, whenever I talk about this, people will say, well, these are just people who come to LA to, you know, see doctors at Cedars and they come in through the ER if they're not feeling well, but that excludes all of those patients. So these are only patients uh, who don't have a, uh, they don't have a diagnosis of a leak uh, and the diagnosis is made by our, uh, by our ER physicians. Now, of course, you all, you, know, you all know this, like when you go to the doctor's office, and if it's, you know, if you see some doctors who are interested in this, you'll see lots of patients lying down. Uh, you might see them uh, walking uh, across the street with a pillow in their hand, and they, you know, they'll, they'll take that. This is actually somebody who, who uses that at college uh, or their, uh, their uh, place of work. Now, what about now, right? So uh, this is a a tremendous conference. We had to, you know, close registration because so many people are here. Is it really has it become sort of mundane and routine? And uh, I think for you know for all of us, it has become not mundane, of course, but it has become routine. Uh, but it's not routine everywhere, right? So still, every week I get calls of uh, of patients who just cannot get a blood patch, for example. Uh, they do a myelogram and oh yeah, there's not a leak, so we're not going to do a blood patch. Or they go to a major medical center somewhere in this country and they're told, well, we'll do one blood patch uh, and if it fails, we can do another one, but you have to wait another six months. So clearly, you know, there's a lot that uh, we need to do better as far as education is concerned and uh, it's certainly not routine practice for everybody. Um, we've seen about uh, a thousand patients now uh, with spontaneous intracranial hypotension um, and we've evaluated about 
1,450 patients. And what's interesting is that of the first 107 patients that I saw who had the diagnosis of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, 89 of them, so that's 83 percent, so, you know, four out of five, uh, actually had spontaneous intracranial hypotension. And by that I mean they met these criteria that we wrote up a few years ago. And in order to meet the criteria, you either have to have, you know, the typical brain MRI or you need to have the typical spine MRI or myelogram that shows that there's a leak or the pressure when we do a lumbar puncture has to be less than uh, six centimeter of water. Um, but of the last 107 patients I saw in the office, only about one-fourth uh, uh, met those criteria. Uh, and there are, of course, you know, many, many different reasons for that. It's not that we've become you know, more exclusive in making the diagnosis. It's just that you know, through the Internet, social media, a lot more patients uh, are being seen uh, for this particular problem. Uh, for our patients, the, uh, the average age has been 45. Uh, we've treated uh, somebody as young as two, a little girl from, uh, from Florida, uh, and the oldest, oldest patient now that I've treated uh, was 91. And clearly, you know, it's more common in, in, uh, in women than it is in men, but really only like in the younger and middle-aged population. So in, in the older population, as you can see here, the men are the, the red bars, the women are the blue bars. Uh, among the, the, the elderly, it's more common in men. Now, why is that? Really, nobody knows. Um, basically, just because of this very first patient I saw, I you know, developed this interest in looking for connective tissue disorders. And of the first 150 patients I saw, a few of them had one of the you know, well-described, well-established uh, connective tissue disorders, uh, but most patients don't really have that, right? But they do have something. So they're a little bit double-jointed. Uh, they might have had a hernia repair in the past. Uh, we have never been able to identify a CSF leak gene just because we haven't really done uh, the research for that. And really, the research for genetics uh, for CSF leaks has really nothing has happened over the last 20 years. Uh, obviously, it's more common in, in, you know, young people and kids. So if you look just at, you know, people younger than 19, uh, about half of them will have a, uh, a connective tissue disorder. Uh, now, the, the picture on the right, you know, not, that's not that uncommon. There are a lot of people who can do that. But the one on the left, that's really, you know, that's, that's really unusual. Um, don't try that. Uh, partially because of this high, you know, frequency, right? So a lot of people, we think, have a connective tissue problem. We try to nowadays get away from doing invasive testing. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But we really try to do non-invasive testing. And then particularly these uh, MR myelograms. So um, some of you are very familiar with that. But the one on the left, that's, uh, that's an MR myelogram of somebody who does not have a spinal fluid leak. And then the other ones just show different you know, leaks or sort of you know, cystic malformations along the spine. The one all the way on the right is that, that two-year-old girl that I mentioned who her whole uh, dura of her spine from her uh, neck down is this very intricate uh, collection of, uh, of diverticula. She's doing, she's doing really well, though. Uh, Dr. Mai has done a couple of blood patches on her uh, over the years. She's really the only patient who, where we had to do that under general anesthesia. Um, so it, it, it can happen at any age. Um, Dr. David Ramoyne was a geneticist at Cedars uh, who I used to work with. He has unfortunately passed away, but a few years ago we looked at quite a few people with spontaneous leaks and uh, we did skin biopsies, dural biopsies, and about one out of five people he found these very unusual uh, fibrils in the, uh, mainly in the skin biopsies. But nobody knew what it meant, right? So he would take it to their genetic meetings, international meetings, and everybody would say, yeah, that, you know, that looks very different, but nobody really knew what it was. Uh, we also know that about one out of five people with spontaneous leaks will have some enlargement of the aorta. Um, usually nothing needs to be done about that, but sometimes it does. Uh, 
and we find that about one out of 10 people have a brain aneurysm. And most of these aneurysms are really, really tiny. Uh, but in the general population, it's maybe only about one or 2%. And so we think genetics is very important, yet uh, it hardly ever runs in the family, right? So there are very few families who are affected by that. So clearly, it's not just something genetic. Uh, something else must have been going on. Now, what that is, uh, we don't really know. Uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of people uh, report that there's some, you know, more or less trivial uh, traumatic event that uh, that precipitates uh, the symptoms of the spinal fluid leak. Um, I think we once wrote that up in the 90s. We called it roller coaster headache or another roller coaster headache. So that you know, obviously can happen, but we do call it spontaneous intracranial hypotension. So when we talk about that, it's really any type of CSF leak that's not caused by a spinal needle, it's not caused by surgery, it's not caused by you know, a gunshot wound. Uh, we also found that uh, there's a little bit of a, a seasonal variation. It's a little bit more common in the spring. Uh, particularly in the month of April. Uh, we found that uh, having uh, undergone bariatric surgery, so really any type of weight loss surgery, uh, can set off symptoms of a spinal fluid leak. And uh, I've now had three patients who got their leak after, uh, after a spider bite. Two of those were uh, brown recluse spiders. Those were patients from, uh, from Texas. Uh, one of them was a patient from a county north of here, uh, Ventura County, where they don't have brown recluse spiders. But it's not probably the, the venom per se, it's just the reaction to the, to the spider bite. All these three patients needed you know, multiple surgeries with incisions in their finger or their thigh just because of the enormous amount of, of swelling and necrosis of the tissue. So we think when your body goes through this enormous you know, defense mechanism against the spider uh, or the spider venom, that that's what might make the dura a little weaker. So we all know that, you know, the headache is the most common symptom. And, uh, you know, we've written and we talk a lot about all the other symptoms that people can have. But virtually everybody, uh, at least in the beginning, starts off with a headache. And usually that's, you know, the typical orthostatic headache, not always. Another symptom that's very, very common is neck pain. With that I mean, you know, pain in the back of the neck or neck stiffness. A lot of people have nausea or vomiting. Problems with hearing, you know, muffled hearing is very common. Light and no noise sensitivity is common. So as you can imagine, you know, a lot of people either get diagnosed with migraine headaches because of the light and noise sensitivity or with a brain hemorrhage, right? That's, you know, neck stiffness. Uh, a headache, and then there are a whole bunch of other symptoms that we'll uh, talk about a little bit. Um, some patients, you know, from the get-go, their headache really doesn't change depending on position. And then some other people even have the reverse, like from the beginning. So these are people who you know, might have an enormous leak, yet they feel better uh, when they're up, and they feel worse when they lay down. Uh, it's a little bit uncommon, but that does happen. Some people really just have exertional headaches or headaches when straining. Uh, I've had patients and they only have a headache when they shake their head. Uh, you also see that in high pressure, but you also can see that in low pressure. Uh, there are some people who get actual trigeminal neuralgia where they have terrible lancinating pain, not in their head, but in their face. And not only is there a, a huge variety as to the number of symptoms, but also how severe it is. So this uh, scan on the left, which is a, an old type of CT myelogram, that was done on a, on a gentleman who uh, I had operated on, her, on his sister for an aneurysm. We sometimes screen families, and he was screened. And on his MRI, he had a lot of meningeal enhancement, and his brain was sagging. We did, or actually somewhere I think up in Nebraska, they did a myelogram, showed a leak, uh, but he felt perfectly fine. So we checked him again six months later and it was all gone. He didn't have the leak anymore, but he never had any symptoms of it. Now contrast that to uh, this CT scan, which was uh, provided uh, to me by, by his widow. He was a, a young man in his 40s who had a bad headache, he had bilateral blood clots on his brain, right, the subdural hematomas. Those were operated on. He got a little worse, and you know, of course, as most neurosurgeons, 
are then worried about high pressure, so they put the head of the bed up, and uh, his, his brain herniated. He had these strokes that you can see. It's a sort of darker area on both sides of the brain, uh, and he died from that. Um, and that still happens uh, even now. Most of the time, you know, people do end up in the ER at some point. Uh, unfortunately, the, the CT scan is usually normal, right? So usually uh, CT scans in normal. Um, as some of you have experienced, you know, when you go to the ER, they'll suspect meningitis, even if you don't have a fever, uh, or they'll uh, suspect a subarachnoid hemorrhage that you just don't see on the CT, so they'll do an LP. That can be really difficult to do. It's hard enough to do it in the ER sometimes, particularly when the pressure is really low. And uh, it's been well established that you can get an elevated uh, count of your white blood cells, so a lot of people do get diagnosed usually with some kind of viral meningitis. Uh, protein is usually uh, elevated as well. Really, the, 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 the number one, two, and three uh, advance in us making the diagnosis is when people started recognizing what you see on the, on the brain MRI. And uh, we came up with this mnemonic SEEPS uh, that stands for the things that you see. Uh, probably the most specific is the sagging of the brain that was first described in the 1970s by some radiologists from New Zealand uh, before the CT scan was invented. Uh, and then Dr. Mokri he was the first one who described this enhancement uh, of, the, of the dura. So this meningeal enhancement, the enhancement of the meninges, uh, really has nothing to do with the dura. It's just that you can really see the blood vessels underneath the dura well. And this is uh, just an example of, of somebody with uh, the subdural hematomas. You see that on the left side. You can see that there are different colors, right? The one is very white, the other one is more gray, and that just indicates you know, different ages of the bleeding. Uh, and this was somebody who had a, a leak. That's the, the asterisk there. That's where the spinal fluid comes out of the dura. And then on the other side, where the little arrow is, that's a, a little cyst that uh, this person had on the other side. Uh, this is an old, an old uh, cisternogram. That's really a test that we don't do anymore. Uh, but you can see really well that there's a leak that's at the bottom of the neck. That's where the arrow points to. And that's what you see with the, uh, the meningeal enhancement. In Europe, we call that the, the white line. Uh, and it just sort of outlines the brain. And then the, really the most uh, obvious thing is this sagging of the brain. You can really... You know, unless you look at a lot of them, you sort of have to compare the before and after uh, in order to, uh, to recognize that. And what, one of the many things that are fascinating about this is that when you have this and you get treatment, then it's all reversible, right? And it can be within hours. Like we once had a patient we, we treated, and I asked the resident to get another MRI in a couple of days. I said two days but he put in two hours. So this patient went to the MRI two hours after surgery, and the brain already had floated back up. Uh, and that also goes for people who've had this for 10, 20, 30 years. It's not only the symptoms are reversible, also what you see uh, on the MRI. Now, that's not for everybody, right? So sometimes it can take up to about six weeks, usually for the meningeal enhancement to resolve. It can take a couple of months for uh, subdural hematomas to resolve. But MRI is very important, but it also has been a little bit of an enemy of patients, right? So a lot of doctors will order an MRI, and then when it's normal, they'll say, well, then you don't have this, right? But in our practice, about one out of five people with a documented leak uh, have a normal brain MRI. Uh, and that, with that, I mean they always have a normal brain MRI. What's more common is that at the beginning, the MRI is abnormal, and then as time passes with or without treatment, uh, the MRI uh, becomes normal. Rarely is it, ab is it normal in the beginning and then becomes abnormal as time goes by. That's, that's really unusual. That's you know, less than 5%. Um, these, are, these are just some, exa some examples of, of patients who had scans done that clearly were abnormal, but they were not recognized as such. So, um, this here, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the pituitary gland. Uh, 
and let's see if this works. Oh, yeah. This little thing is the pituitary gland, and it's enlarged. It's not normal. It's a little bigger. So they went to a neurosurgeon, and he said, oh, that's a tumor, and the patient ended up uh, with having the pituitary gland removed. The patient did fine afterwards, but it was not necessary. Uh, this patient had the subdural hematomas removed, and then if you, if you don't also treat the leak, I mean, it's sometimes a good idea to remove the subdural hematomas, uh, but then you also have to fix the leak, right? Because if you don't, they will definitely come back. Uh, and then this patient, who just has a little bit of meningeal enhancement, underwent a brain biopsy. Uh, this patient, here you can see how the brain is sort of falling down, uh, and you see that there's bone missing here. Uh, they oper operated on this patient three times for what they thought was a Chiari malformation. And then this patient, the brain looks a little swollen, probably difficult to see, but there's very little, you know, black here in this CT scan, so you don't really see the spinal fluid there. Uh, and they tried to put in a, a monitor because they thought there was a lot of swelling of the brain. The patient was wide awake, and then you can imagine it's difficult for the residents to, to put, in, uh, put in a monitor. Um, this is just, you know, the subdural hematomas. You usually don't need to evacuate those. Um, this, the one on the right, you already saw the one on the left. The one on the right was a gentleman where exactly the same thing happened. Uh, but he did survive his strokes uh, after uh, the uh, removal of the subdurals. Uh, like I said before, we, we, we try to get away from invasive imaging, at least in the beginning. So almost everybody uh, starts off with, uh, with the MRI myelogram. And with that, we talk about just a plain MRI scan. You don't need a spinal tap. It's just heavily weighted for spinal fluid. Uh, we don't really do uh, the radioactive uh, cisternography anymore. I haven't ordered that for at least 10 years. Uh, we usually don't get CT myelograms anymore because MRI myelograms are so good. Uh, we rely a lot on this digital myelography. Uh, we have done intra, intrathecal uh, delivery of gadolinium, right? So gadolinium is the uh, contrast that you use for MRI. And if you dilute it, it's very important to dilute it because if you inject it into the spinal fluid, you'll get seizures and uh, sometimes permanent impairment, but if you dilute it, it's perfectly safe. Uh, and some people, like the group at UC San Francisco, they, uh, they have good results with that. We just haven't been able to find a lot of people uh, where that showed a leak, uh, where the other tests did not show a leak. So we, we use it, just not very frequently. Um, another thing that's really important to realize, right, is that half of the time when we know there must be a leak, we cannot find it, right, on a myelogram, just for whatever reason. And then oftentimes people are, are looked at to see if they're leaking from their nose, even if there's no drainage from the nose. But spinal fluid leaks from the skull base, right, from the nose or ear, does not cause spontaneous intracranial hypotension. That does not cause uh, positional headaches. Uh, a few years ago, I, we looked at, you know, a lot of different patients that we saw and what type of leaks they've had, and we really, uh, we found that there are basically three types of leaks, and um, this type 1 leak are people who have uh, a hole or a tear uh, in the dura, right? The dura is that, that membrane that covers the spinal fluid and the spinal cord. Uh, and in our patients, about one out of five, uh, uh, they have one of these leaks. And um, you can see that here. So uh, this is an MRI looking from the side. These are the vertebrae. And then that column that's dark gray, that's the spinal cord. And then right in front of that, this is the front, this is the back. Right in front of that, there's a very tiny, thin line. That's the dura. The dura should be attached to the bone, but it's not because there's this big column of spinal fluid that's outside of the dura. Um, and this is one of these digital myelograms with the fluid coming out in front of the spinal cord. Uh, this is the CT. There you can see the uh, fluid outside of the spinal cord. This is the spinal cord. And then this is what that looks, uh, I think this was a different patient, but uh, this is the spinal cord looking from the back. Uh, and then this is the dura, and I remove a little bone here on the side. Uh, 
and that allows me to sort of sweep the dura away from underneath the spinal cord uh, and find the hole. Uh, a lot of those holes are, are related to a little piece of bone, and that little piece of bone either has gone through the dura or it's been rubbing against the dura, and then at some point uh, the dura split. So about 75, 80% of people who have this type of leak, what we call a type 1 leak, uh, have a little piece of bone with it. And sometimes it's not in front of the spinal cord, but it's on the side of the spinal cord. Um, a lot of patients end up with surgery who have this because it's really difficult to treat it. Uh, number two reason is because of the uh, piece of bone, but the number one reason is it's really difficult, uh, even in the most sophisticated hands, to, uh, you know, to put blood or glue uh, safely in front of the spinal cord. Then what we call the type 2 leak are people who have cysts, and uh, that can be uh, this type of cyst, where uh, this is an MRI myelogram, there are a lot of little cysts, right? Now, that's definitely more common in people with spontaneous intracranial hypotension, but you also can see that in people who don't have any symptoms of a leak. But then usually it's not this many. But when you have a patient like this and you don't really know which one is leaking, you can, of course, you know, attack some of them uh, with glue or even with surgery. Uh, we try to, you know, do these myelograms to see if we can find where exactly the leak is coming from. And here, it was coming from uh, from this cyst. Usually, it's the largest, most irregular cyst, but not always. So I've operated on people who have like giant cyst that's not leaking, and on the other side, they have a tiny cyst, and that's the one that's leaking. Uh, this is again what this looks like. Uh, let's see. Uh, after the uh, CT myelogram or, or DSM. So this, again, is the spinal cord. Uh, this is the cyst with the fluid coming out. Um, and then this is what that looks like under the microscope. Uh, we divided these type 2 uh, leaks up in two types, the type 2A that you just looked at, and then type 2B are people who have very irregular cysts, very, uh, these are very odd cysts because they are very far away from the spinal cord. Uh, here you see that the dura really is extremely irregular. This is something that's uh, very unusual. This is difficult to treat uh, because the dura is so thin that if you do blood patches there uh, or glue or surgery, there's a, there's a high, high chance of making it worse. And then this uh, third type that we identified is, uh, is sort of a new entity. It's called the CSF venous fistula. Uh, we found that totally by chance uh, about four years ago or so. And uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to see, I think, but these are different digital subtraction myelograms. And then here you see that there's a vein coming out of the dura. There's a vein coming out of a tiny cyst there. Uh, and then there's another vein coming out of the dura. And then what that looks like at surgery is this is the, uh, this is the dura, and it's like there's a little leech coming out, uh, and that is really sucking up your spinal fluid. And there's also a little blood, that's why it looks blue. And then what we call the type 4 leak are people uh, where we don't know what type of leak it is. So if it's not 1, 2, or 3, then uh, we call it number 4. <laughs> Um, I think this is, this is something that, but I remember as a resident, I operated on a few people who we thought had a leak really high up in the neck, right, between the number one and two uh, vertebra in the neck that you can see here, right there. So the, the fluid is coming out, uh, but we realized that the actual leak is somewhere lower down in the spine. Um, and when I was a resident, the ones that we operated on, you, I mean, you didn't, you saw a spinal fluid, but you didn't see a hole in the dura. Uh, so we, we published that maybe, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago. And then in that paper, we said, oh, these people obviously are leaking lower down in the neck. Well, that also didn't turn out to be true. They were actually leaking in the middle part of their spine, in the thoracic spine. And then it looks sometimes that it's also coming out where the neck meets the thoracic spine. 
uh, as you can see here. So th also, especially when you read like old reports uh, about this, a lot of people will say, oh, a lot of these leaks are at what we call the cervical thoracic junction. So where your, uh, where your neck meets the, uh, the rest of your body. But at least for, the, for these leaks at C1, C2, right, we published that. A lot of people have published that. I thought that was pretty well known. And then uh, on Thursday, the day before yesterday, I called a patient uh, from Kentucky uh, who had sent in her films. And uh, this is what it looked like. So you can see again that there's a lot of fluid outside of the dura. And it's coming here at C1, C2. And you know, we're talking about it like, oh, you know, I know they said it's probably at C1, T C2, but that's not where it is. Uh, why don't you come down here? When do you want to come out? And she's like, oh, I just had surgery. So she was actually, when I called her, she was in the recovery room uh, of a local hospital. So even though we publish about it and other people write about it, it's still, you know, not very well known. So we're not doing a very good job in, in uh, getting the word out sometimes. Uh, so again, right, we try to, to become more of a non-invasive sort, of, uh, sort of shop. Um, we start off with a brain uh, MRI or a CT, then we get an MRI myelogram, and then based on that, almost always without doing other testing, we go to epidural blood patching. If that doesn't work and there's a, uh, there's a good um, target, we can inject glue. Uh, I haven't done any surgery uh, just based on uh, MRI techniques, but uh, I know some other neurosurgeons have, and there's really no reason, if everything is crystal clear, why you would have to get uh, a more invasive test. Um, especially when people come into the ER on a Friday and, you know, it's hard to get something done over the weekend, uh, we put them uh, on bed rest. How long should you put people on bed rest? Nobody really knows. Uh, I've operated on people who've been on bed rest for 9 or 12 months. Uh, when that happens, you're at really high risk of getting a venous thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism. Uh, but still, I mean, these are people not just from other countries, also from the U.S., who are just put on bed rest for three months. Uh, I think abdominal binders, uh, some people really get a lot of benefit from it. Other people really don't. Um, but we, are, we have a very low threshold in, in recommending blood patching. Now, if the blood patch works, but only temporarily, you can just repeat it, right? You can repeat it once, you can repeat it twice, you can do it 20, 30 times. There's really no uh, set limit. But clearly, the more blood patches you have, there's a little bit of a, of a higher uh, risk associated with it. Sometimes people get a lot of scarring, and they're really not able to tolerate blood patching anymore. Uh, if blood patches don't work anymore, and there's a, there's a good target, uh, Dr. Mai and Dr. Moser started doing these uh, glue injections back in 2003, I believe. Uh, and I think that's a really good treatment for, uh, to avoid surgery. And then when uh, other things fail, uh, we do surgery. Um, so for blood patching, you can, you know, the very first blood patch done was only half a cc and was very successful. Uh, we've gone up to about, I think, 135 cc's. Uh, with the glue, right, it's a little bit different than blood patching, but you can target, you know, many different targets. Um, and then for surgery, uh, there are different ways of doing it, right? So really the most straightforward way is, is what you see here, where there's a, there's a hole in the dura, and we suture it. Um, if it's uh, a cyst, I still treat a lot of those with the same type of aneurysm clips that we first used back in 1991. It seems to work really well. Uh, for these fistulas, I, I put little clips on them so there's no more uh, flow of spinal fluid uh, through them, although you can also just, you know, cauterize those. Um, and then as far as, you know, what is the success of treatment? And uh, we, don't, we don't really know. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of a better answer uh, in a year. Um, but I think about, you know, 9 out of 10 people get better with a blood patch, right? So if you have somebody with a leak who really doesn't get any better, that's unusual. I think about 80% of people are cured with one or two blood patches, right? So these are people you never hear about. So when I give talks here in California or, you know, Nevada for like the local uh, 
physicians, neurologists, they'll, you know, come up to me afterwards and they're like, oh, you know, you have so many patients, so many have surgery, and they say, you know, I see two or three of these people a year and we do blood patches and they're cured. I never see them back. Um, so obviously we, we, you know, we miss those people when we look at, at our patient population. And also most of those patients, you know, will not go on the internet and talk about their uh, experience. Uh, for glue, I think we're about able to cure maybe 40% of patients, but these are almost always people uh, who have failed uh, blood patching. Uh, if it's a cyst that's leaking uh, with surgery, about nine out of 10 people are cured. If I operate just on a cyst or multiple cysts, but we don't know which one is leaking, uh, then about three out of four people are cured. Uh, before we did this digital myelography and if somebody had one of these big leaks in front of the spinal cord and I didn't really know where it was coming from, I would sometimes operate on them. I would enter that cyst, inject glue, blood, a um, little gel foam, and the cure rate of that was very, very low. Uh, but when we know where it is and we see the, the hole and you know, we're able to suture it or put a little muscle graft through it, uh, then the cure rate is about, uh, is about 90, 95%. Risks of treatment, uh, we had two patients who became paraplegic after their blood patch. I was gonna take them to the OR to take the blood clot out. Uh, by, by the time they came out of the MRI scanner, they had regained normal strength. So that was you know, very, very transient. Uh, we've had a few patients with uh, persistent, uh, you know, like sciatica, um, but very uncommon. Uh, with glue injections, uh, we had one patient who developed an infection. Uh, aseptic meningitis is, is a little bit more, more common, so sometimes when people get a glue injection, uh, they start having a little bit of a fever, pain, neck pain, and I think that some of the glue that maybe uh, inadvertently goes into the spinal fluid. And then with surgery, at Cedars, about one out of 100 people get an infection. I've had a few patients who developed uh, weakness in their legs. Uh, most of those were people who had prior surgery and the spinal cord was, uh, uh, was all scarred down. About one out of 30 people with surgery I actually cause a spinal fluid leak. So for these uh, leaks in front of the spinal cord, as you can see here, that can be a really big collection of fluid and it's displacing the spinal cord to the side. Um, Let's see, this one probably doesn't work. Uh, for the ones in front of the spinal cord, we use the digital myelography. Sometimes it's really easy to see, like on the left, but the one on the right is a little bit more difficult uh, to interpret. Um, now, some people, uh, when they have these uh, larger leaks that go on for years, uh, they can develop you know, different things, like this is somebody uh, who has what's called superficial siderosis, where uh, because of bleeding around the, the site of the leak, there's little deposits of iron around the brain. That's this black line, so not the white line, that's meningeal enhancement, but this black line, here's the cerebellum, that's uh, superficial siderosis. A lot of people have this and they have no symptoms from it, but if it continues and it becomes worse and you don't fix the leak, uh, the main symptoms of that uh, are hearing loss and, uh, and trouble keeping your balance. Then there's this, uh, uh, this other problem that people can run into if the leak is not fixed. And it looks very much like ALS. So these are people who have positional headaches. They have a leak. It's either treated or not treated. The headache sort of goes away. And then after years, they develop very bad atrophy of the muscles of the shoulder and the fingers. Um, they develop weakness, and it looks like you know Lou Gehrig's disease. But what they really have is this uh, pocket of fluid that's not only in front of the spinal cord, but also around the spinal cord, and it causes a lot of stretching uh, on the nerves. Well, can you see uh, if you can play this little video on the right? So that's what that looks like. This is a young man in his 30s from Israel who's had a leak since 2000, and then over the last five years, that's all he can do with his, uh, with his arms. 
and uh, he'd had a leak for about 16 years or so. So the, uh, the goal of surgery is really to prevent it from getting worse. Only if you get it within the first few years uh, are you able to uh, sort of reverse that and make it better. Another thing we sometimes see is if there's this hole and it's not treated that the spinal cord gets stuck to the hole and it actually goes outside of the dura uh, and it's called spinal cord herniation. Every single patient with this spinal cord herniation has a spinal fluid leak. So typically these are people who have orthostatic headaches. It either goes away spontaneously, they get treated but they still have the leak and then over years they develop weakness, paraplegia, uh, or just numbness uh, in one of the lower extremities. Um, we won't talk about that. Now, what's interesting is that all of these people who have uh, a type 1A leak with the, uh, the little hole in front of the spinal cord, it all looks, you know, looks very, very similar. So patients uh, who are sent to me by, you know, some doctors who, who send a lot of patients for surgery, and I'll send them these little pictures. Afterwards, they almost all of them will say, oh, that's just like the one you sent me six months ago. But when I tell them to actually check it out, they'll see it, it is different. Um, so I think this is, so this is, uh, uh, this is one example. Um, so what you're looking at here, this is the spinal cord. This is a nerve coming out of the spinal cord. And then this is a little piece of bone uh, that's sticking through it. And then this is the, uh, the hole that it has created. So this is just an example of one of these little, little calcified discs that you can just remove here. That's the, the piece of calcium. You can just remove that with the surgery and then that's what it looks like afterwards. It's, it's handy, this is an ultrasound. You can use it at surgery. And here you see that piece of bone uh, that's sticking into the spinal cord, just like here. So this is the spinal cord. These are the vertebra. This is our surgical excess. And there you see that piece of bone that's sticking into the spinal cord. Now sometimes I do these surgeries on people who don't have a leak, but I think they have a leak. Usually it's because some older imaging showed it or because they have this very specific type of calcium. And uh, what you can see here is that it's a hole, but it's completely covered up with scar tissue. Um, and there are probably little micro rents in that scar tissue that causes the symptoms. And then this is what it looks like after I take that scar tissue down. Same here, you just see a piece of bone that's like inside of the dura, that's very abnormal. And then when you take a little piece of bone out, you're left with uh, one of those typical uh, dural holes. Um, sometimes I do this surgery that's called dural reduction surgery. Um, that's a surgery that has sort of a, uh, uh, this is what that looks like. So this is uh, the dura. Uh, it's in the lower part of the spine. We always like operating there because there's no spinal cord. Then I remove a part of the dura and then we suture it back together. And um, these, are, these are some identical twins who had that surgery done. You can see they're you know, hypermobile. Now, it was a little bit of an ethical dilemma, so to speak, because the one twin, I forget which one, she had six blood patches done. She really didn't want to have more blood patches. Uh, so I did the surgery. But the other twin only had one blood patch done, and it didn't work. But they sort of wanted to have the surgery done on the same day. I mean, it's the only time I've ever done this surgery on somebody who had only had a single blood patch done. Uh, the results of it are not, are not that good. Uh, really only about 60% of people uh, benefit from it. Um, and with good outcome, I mean that, so these are not necessarily people who have no symptoms, but they're people who don't really want more treatment. Um, so, you know, I do most of these type of surgeries on people who don't have spontaneous intracranial hypotension, uh, but, you know, we think that they have it. Um, we also developed this other uh, technique that we call a wearable catheter infusion system. Uh, 
uh, where we uh, place a uh, spinal catheter in the epidural space and then we uh, tunnel that underneath the skin and we attach it to a little portacath. We place that over a rib so uh, the person or their physician or a nurse can access that and uh, infuse themselves with uh, artificial spinal fluid that means normal saline. Uh, it's very, very cumbersome. Uh, it's very mechanical, so it usually fails at some point if people have it long enough. Uh, but there have been people, that, so when it's working, right, when you're able to infuse yourself, they feel better. The reason for that is that before I do the surgery, uh, uh, the anesthesiologist will place a catheter and will infuse them, and if they don't get better, then I don't do the surgery. Uh, then, I'll, just briefly, I'll talk about this, uh, this uh, other uh, problem that people can have with spinal fluid leaks. It's called uh, frontotemporal dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is the second most common type of dementia in people under 60. Uh, it can be very, very devastating. Uh, people have lost their jobs because of it. People have been in nursing homes because of it. Uh, they're generally young uh, people. Um, and what they all have in common is that they have a lot, a lot of brain sagging. So in order to have this, you need to have brain sagging. It's not always where it looks like a Chiari, right? So it's not always where it looks like the back part is, is sagging, but it's always the midbrain. It's always the temporal lobes. And uh, when, when we looked at this, we found that people who had had previous Chiari surgery, because sometimes it looks like that, like a Chiari, they did much worse than people who did not have Chiari surgery. And the reason, I think, because they weren't, clinically they weren't any worse, their symptoms weren't any worse, it's just that they found a neurosurgeon who operated on them. I think the reason is that when you do the Chiari decompression, you cause scarring of the brain and it doesn't, it's not longer able to, uh, to float back up. Uh, can you uh, can you play that one on the left with the little speaker symbol? Now this is this is a gentleman I operated on uh, last Wednesday, and uh, one of the the typical features of frontotemporal dementia is this inertia. So he would sit uh, uh, on the toilet literally for two or three hours, and his wife would have to tell him. You, you have to get off of the toilet. Or he would brush his teeth, and he would keep brushing his teeth for literally 15, 20 minutes, and he would have to be prompted to stop doing that. Um, and then maybe the one on the right. And then... Uh, I felt better after my surgery, and I'm doing really good. I so what, what, what dementia doctors find amazing is that uh, in general, frontotemporal dementia, it's not treatable, right? So if you diagnose somebody with this, it's called behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, it's really not a treatable problem. Uh, so if you find this, even though it is much more difficult to treat than most people with uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension, it is reversible. So this is one of the you know, rare types of dementia uh, that's called reversible dementia. And then just uh, briefly, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, spinal taps, uh, four minutes. Um, so, you know, almost every doctor is, is familiar with, you know, an LP type of headache. But if somebody comes in and says, oh, I had uh, that headache uh, a year ago and I still have it, they'll say, oh, well, I mean, it cannot be there for a year. Obviously, that's wrong. Uh, but that's what, you know, what, what most doctors think. Uh, so this is an example. This is a, a, a girl I saw uh, about a year ago or so. She was uh, 31 weeks pregnant. She had a history of pseudotumor. Uh, she had many ventriculoperitoneal, lumboperitoneal shunts done to shunt the spinal fluid uh, since she was about 11. And then uh, she had two years of really orthostatic headaches. And uh, she had uh, four of her shunts revised, and nowadays we usually put in a variable type of valve that you can adjust. It was adjusted 11 times, wasn't any better. Um, she went to a major medical center, and she was diagnosed with POTS. Uh, 
Uh, and then she came to our office and she saw one of my, my colleagues, Dr. Ray Chu, who I uh, do a lot of surgeries with, and uh, I was out of the country, but he said, oh, that sounds like a spinal fluid leak. So he ordered uh, an MRI scan, and, uh, and lo and behold, she had, as you can see here, there's a big collection of spinal fluid in front of her spinal cord. We did a digital myelogram. No, actually, we didn't. We first did, Dr. Maya did a regular blood patch because she was still pregnant. And that made her, you know, feel pretty comfortable till the baby was delivered. Afterwards, uh, we did the myelogram and it showed uh, this leak. Not, this is the middle part of the spine on the right, on the left side. The leak was in the lumbar spine where she must have had one of her spinal taps, one of her LP shunts placed. And then at surgery, you see there's like a tiny little pinhole, and that can only be caused by a needle. Um, so it just took one single suture, and uh, her leak was gone. And then the other one, two minutes I have, 27-year-old uh, man, somewhere in the Midwest, very, very nice man, has had orthostatic headaches since he was 10. So when he was 10, he visited his grandparents in Vegas, and he had a little bit of a fever, uh, wasn't feeling so well, a little headachey, went to the ER and they did a lumbar puncture. And ever since that time, he'd had orthostatic headaches. He saw a lot of uh, physicians over the years. He was told that he uh, has some strange cyst in the thoracic spine. They were gonna operate on that. Um, then after that, he also developed paraplegia. At least, he said, I cannot move my legs anymore. That was not true, it was psychogenic paraplegia, and it was caused because nobody believed him that you know, he was having headaches. Um, I forget how they found us, but uh, this is what that showed. So very similar to that first patient, there's a leak in front of the spinal cord. Uh, it goes all the way up and down the spine. It does go up to the thoracic spine, but that's not where it's coming from. Uh, and then this is what that looked like at surgery, so that's a little hole. It only took one suture, and then his MRI two days later shows that that leak is completely gone. Um, also, right after surgery, he could move his legs again, but that was, that was not from the surgery. It was, you know, because he, he felt that he was fixed. All right, thank you. We'll take some questions. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's not uncommon at all. And you can have that from a spontaneous leak or any kind of leak, from an epidural, from a spinal tap. Yes. Um, can a bulging disc um, in the back also lead to a leak or symptoms of a leak? Uh, yeah, not, you know, not like a, a bulging soft disc, right? So if it's a soft disc, that doesn't really do it. But if it has one of those, you know, little bony spicules with it, right. that can cause a leak. But, you know, I mean, everybody over the age of 15 has bulging discs. So, <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily where the leak is coming from. Um, after a blood patch, the healing is two weeks to two months, and um, what, what determines which patients require, or is it just different patients' bodies heal differently? Um, how does that work? Yeah, I think, I think definitely, you know, people's bodies do heal differently. Uh, I usually tell people to, you know, listen to some restrictions that we have for about four weeks. Uh, Dr. Louis will tell the same patient five minutes later, it's gonna be two months. So it's, you know, it, it can be a little confusing, and I think that just, that just underscores the fact that nobody really knows, right? Nobody has really looked at this in a, in a scientific fashion. Uh, 15 years ago or so, I would put people in the hospital for five days after a blood patch for bed rest. Didn't really seem to make any difference, uh, but we don't, you know, we don't really know. Yes. Um, so you can have tinnitus from a spinal fluid leak. Uh, you can also uh, cause 
postural tinnitus. That's usually not with surgery. It's usually with blood patches because with blood patches, it, you know, it, you go from a low pressure state very acutely, like within seconds or minutes, to sometimes a high pressure state. And that change in pressure can, it's almost like, you know, damaging the ear. Uh, you usually don't see that with surgery so much because, you know, that takes a little bit longer. Yeah, you had referenced a uh, patient who had ALS-like symptoms and myelopathy. It, was there a different uh, treatment for that patient, or is there some different course you would take with them? Well, really, the only treatment for that is, uh, is surgery. I think uh, actually not all of them are in front of the spinal cord. I recently treated somebody who had a leak on the side of the spinal cord and had this, this ALS-type uh, problem. Uh, you can try to do uh, blood patches or glue. Uh, but with, with those people, I'm very aggressive because I think the longer it lasts, you really have, you know, much less success in, in making sure that people don't progress. Do any of these patients you talked about finding the actual leak site? What do you recommend for patients that run under all these tests and reach all the symptoms and things that they can just ask to find out and it doesn't work? Yeah, so that, you know, that's a pretty common scenario in our practice. I think it's important to realize that, you know, for the vast majority of people who have leaks, you don't need to know where it's coming from, right? Uh, but if people fail the usual treatments, then it, then it does become necessary. So uh, if we never find a leak uh, and people don't get any better with blood patches, right, not even transiently or only for a few days, we sometimes do this infusion of, uh, of normal saline for a few days to see if people get better. And that's really more meant uh, to see if that person is low on spinal fluid. So if we do this infusion um, uh, and they don't feel any better, then probably they don't have a spinal fluid leak. Now we also oftentimes repeat the, uh, the digital myelogram at the end of the infusion when the person is kind of tanked up on fluid. But the actual yield of that, so the actual chance of finding a leak is, you know, is pretty low with that. So I had this happen to me about four years ago, and I have times of complete recovery, and then reoccurrence several months in between. What causes those reoccurrence if you never found a leak? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't have the answer for that per se, but that's not uncommon, right? So some people, uh, symptoms resolve either spontaneously or with whatever kind of treatment then they don't have any symptoms and then it comes back they don't have any symptoms and these episodes like we just did a myelogram yesterday uh, on a girl who lives pretty close by in Orange County and uh, I saw her maybe I don't know back in May she did not have any symptoms and I said when you have your symptoms when this episode comes on then call me and then we'll set it up right away um, so that's, you know, something to consider. Okay. Um, for somebody who was a long-term leaker, about uh, 30 years, um, and then got sealed and went into RHP, um, how long would you wait in RHP before you did something like surgical to, um, to get her out of high pressure? Yeah, well... Um, it depends, right? So most people, regardless of the duration of symptoms, we actually just uh, finished looking at that. Uh, so even when you've had a leak for two days or for 20 years, it doesn't seem to make a difference as to whether or not you go into rebound high pressure headaches. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's what it seems to be. Uh, so even if you've had a leak for 30 years and it's fixed, what we usually do is you know, put people on Diamox, on acetazolamide for three weeks, and then we taper uh, that off. And then if there's still high pressure problems, you can, you know, use different medications. Uh, you can use Topamax, you can use uh, diuretics. If all of that fails or people just don't tolerate the medication, uh,